The echo command is one of the basic commands on any system. It works on Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. As the echo imp as the name implies, you the, the command directly outputs to the terminal what you have given in quotes. For example, if you write echo echo, since echo is in quotations, it will give us echo. Or echo Linux. There is no limitation on what you can in put inside the quotes. It could be a word, it could be a sentence, or it could be an entire paragraph. For example, we could write echo testing echo, and we'll get testing echo back in the terminal. You can also use as the echo command to directly output to a file. By using the greater than sign, you just have to give it a file name, like file.txt. As you can see, we have a new file in our directory called file.txt. If you open this file, you get testing echo. If we open this file right now, let me just increase the font. So as you can see, we have testing echo, which is directly what we put into the quotations. So if you do this, this is, if you, you can put any name in the file name you want, for example, example.txt. And if you open this one up, we get this as an example text. So we have seen we have example.txt and if you open this we have this is an example text now one if you only use one greater than sign it will overwrite everything we have in the file so if we do this again we won't see anything but if you instead you uh, for to make more sense of this if we use another text like this is linux it won't add directly to file it will just overwrite everything we have in the file. But if we instead have two double greater than signs, it will add directly to the end of the file. So if we do this a couple more times, we are basically adding the text at the end of each line. So if we reload this, we can see that we have four lines instead of only one. So this is the difference between using one or two greater than signs. So let's add another one. If we instead use a single greater than sign, we replace or overwrite everything that we have already written, so we only get one single one. But if we use two greater than signs, we add to the end of the file, so add. And if we input the text in, we get single one and add. So the endless command is one of the basic commands on the Linux system, and it is very useful for beginners and professionals, be professionals because it allows you to see the folders and files in the directory. So given a directory, the endless command allows you to see all the files and directories. So in the terminal, if you type ls, you can see the folders and files. So the, it gives you a text output, the ls command, in the terminal. So desktop, downloads, and documents. And if you use a file explorer, you can also see documents, downloads, the desktop, pictures, and the folders and files generally. And if we scroll down, you can see the files, example.txt and file.txt. And... For a second there, what you saw were hidden files, so hidden files. The endless command also has also has some flags, so options. If you type, if you use the option A, it allows you to see all the files, including hidden hidden files and folders. So hidden files and folders start with dot, so dot bash rc or anything. In the file in the file explorer, we can see hidden files using by turning on the options in views. So these are the hidden files. So let's turn it off. So 
by default the ls command only shows you viewable or non-hidden files and folders so with the lsa you can see all the hidden ones and all the hidden files so if we turn on again you can see them these are the hidden folders that start with dot and these are the hidden files that start with dot so hidden files and folders are two different things so if we unhide them again the ls command also instead of only using a you can use other flags like ls slash l uh, ls da ls dash l this is when we are using the a now we can use l if you want uh, if you want you can use ls l so this is the longer text so it shows you more information the date when it was created the for example the data was created the group and the file folder the permissions the permissions of the, the files and folders you can also use other other flags like human readable human readable size so ls uh, ls dash h ls dash h yeah i think it's the ls dash h ls h h or lss so lshl uh, gives you a long format and to shows you the total size so you can also see the individual sizes using the long format or you can uh, only see the sizes without the long by using lhs so it only shows you the sizes in human readable text like kilobytes megabytes gigabytes or and so on like that and you can also uh, you can also the ls command also has many other flags and you can see this with using the manual so man ls it allows you to see all the options and it gives you some information about the command like using a capital a the b the block escape block size b and if we scroll down to h we can see our human readable flag human readable flag yes human readable you can print the sizes in megabytes kilobytes and whatever options you want so to quit this manual you just have to touch q so type q and if you want to see so this is a manual and you just have to use q to get out so we can also combine commands by as so for example ll if you type ll it is the, sh the shorter version of ls with long so in uh, linux you can have uh, commands that are shorter or larger than normal so you can see that, that basically they are the same thing and if you you can also combine them into just one word so ls um s and l so this is what it looks like with human readable and size but you can also combine them with hs so they give you the same output by combining them into one word you can also combine for example with long and you get hsl now you can combine all three of them with dash hsl The cd command or the change directory command is one of the most fundamental commands in any system. It works on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, and it allows you to traverse the file system. So from to go from folder to folder, both up and down the file structure. For example, here we have the directory Kali Linux, and here we have the terminal. So for example, if you go to desktop right here, we see that we have traversed here into the desktop. So if we go back one folder up, we can see where we are. Now, if we say, if we list files here, we can see that this, this folder and this folder, we are exactly at the same place right here. So if we want to go to desktop, like we do right here, we just have to say CD, then desktop. And if we list the files here, we can see here. So folder to PDF. So the files match here. So we have gone uh, gone to the desktop folder. So you can see that the directory right here has changed from this to this. 
So if we want to go up one more folder to where we were, we just have to type cd, then two dots with a backslash, two dots and the backslash. So if we leave pants again, we see that we are back, back where we started. So if you want to know where you are right now, you just have to, you just have to type pwd, which is print working directory. So you can see that we are at home caddy. So you might be wondering why you don't see home caddy right here. So when Linux starts or when you start the terminal, you usually start at the directory of the user. So home caddy. So caddy is the user we are logged in as. So when you are logged in as home caddy and you start at home caddy, the system thinks that that is the root directory. So if you want to go to the root directory of your hard drive, you just have to type dev slash dev slash and you can change this together so to get up another folder you just you just touch it again then you are now at the actual root of your hard drive as the actual root of your drives and your list right here these are all the files so these are all the root for, for file for folders like the pin drives the boot the drivers and all of this i would recommend that you do not touch these files because they are necessary for Linux to run. So if you want to go back, we just we just go back. So home, and you change this together. So we were at home, then Kali, and then if we end this back, we can see all of this. So the change directory allows you to move like this, and if you you can also move up then sideways. So for example, if you go back. We see ls. Uh, this is only one folder. If we go back, you can see that there is all these folders. Now, if I go to the home directory, then from the home directory, if I want to go to the boot directory, for example, let's say I want to go home. Now I'm in the home directory here directory. So I want to go one up, then to the boot, uh, the boot directory. So I just have to go one up, then to the boot. See, I just changed where I am. So one up, one sideways. So you just have to change uh, chain these commands together. And one tip, if you are on a Linux or Windows in general, you can just type the first letter. And if there is no folder or file matching what you have just typed in, you could just uh, tap tab. Then it will auto complete for you. So that will save you a lot of time. And if you want to get rid of all this information and start over, you could just type clear. And that is also CLS, clear screen, or CLS on Windows and clear on Linux. So the cat command allows you to output directly to a file, the contents, the contents of a file to the terminal. For example, you have example.txt and file.txt. If we cut example.txt, we will see the output. So if we open this in the text editor, we can see that the text is the same thing. So the cut command basically allows you to see what is inside the file. So if you cut file.txt, we see testing echo and the same thing happens in the text editor. Now, if you don't have the if the cat command doesn't work on your computer, you can also use tac, which is reverse cat. And it basically does the same thing, but uh, it has some limitations. For example, if we type cat uh, double, double dash uh, help, we can see that the cat flag, the cat flag has more flags. The cat, the cat command has more flags and more options than the tag command. So just keep that in mind if you don't have access to cat. We can also use egg head to see the head of the file. So head, so starting from the head, you uh, from the head to the bottom, you can also control how many lines you display with the head command. If you use the end flag, so head uh, head the double slash end example dot uh, We forgot the flag, so forgot the flag. So head dash n, you have to use the end flag. And one example.txt, this allows you to see one line from the head 
so single one you can increase this to as much as you want so we can instead use two so if we use two we'll see both lines and you can also use the tail command which allows you to see from the bottom so for this we will see from the bottom up and you'll see everything so if you want to control it it's the same as the head using the end flag one so we'll see add if we use a two we'll see the entire file for this case we'll see the entire file and these are the commands and one other command is xst example those text team now what you see here is uh two things first of all is the line starting zero 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 and the hexadecimals five three and the other hexadecimals and the text so hexadecimals are a way of representing characters we will not use them in this uh, series but if you know hexadecimals just know that they are represent representing hexadecimals digits but uh, these are not uh, commonly used and will not use them in this series. Well, one other command you could use is base64. So if you just type base64, then your file name for this is going to be example.txt. So base64 example.txt. It will give you the base64 representation of what you have typed in. So this is this so these two things are the same thing in base64 presentation we can decode this back with base64 double slash in a decode decode okay we the decode is wrong so we just use decode and you'll see that we have reported it back to where it was now these are all the basic commands you can use to see so if we clear this up so to summarize we have used the cat command to see you can use the cat command to see the contents of any file 99 percent of the time you can use the cat command if not you could use the tat command so today we are going to learn about the find command the find command is a very simple command that allows you to search the names of files or folders so for example here we typed in find in this directory minus name and dot txt files all txt files with the asterisk signs allows you to find all files that match that criteria so you in this uh, in this folder we have example dot txt files dot txt so if we want to find all all the files that have for example that end in dot txt file we would type asterisk or in a document we type dot doc or a document or mp3 file whatever so this allows you to search for any files that meet your criteria now if you want to search for the name instead of the type of file you could just use a asterisk and and example and asterisk so this we use two asterisk first at the start and first at the end so it allows you to search for any file that has the name example in it this file we use two asterisks because we don't want it to start with example or end in example if we instead wanted to start with example we could just type we could just erase the first asterisk so it will only show the files that start with example so if we actually just erase them and go back we'll see that we only find one but if we instead want to uh, make it that it ends with example.txt we would just erase the other one and we would get both files because they both end in example.txt and this uh, this is how the find uh, the find works and you can use any anything or anything so if you instead use linux you can see that this file has linux Today we are going to learn about the grep command. The grep command is sort of like the find command, but unlike the find command, it searches the contents of the files instead of the name of the file instead. So for example, if we search Linux in any files, in any text files, we will see that there are none. Let's search file. So there are no files or Linux in any text files. 
okay so there basically there's no linux or file written in the, these files so let's just search for echo so if we search echo we will get a line that contains the word echo or the word we have typed in in any file matching our criteria for example we see file.txt has the word echo inside it in the first line and let's add some new words so we can learn more about it so let's save it uh, okay let, let's let's open it to put it side by side so if we put this side by side and we search for echo again we will find the two lines so the ec the grip command gives us the line that contains the word we are searching and it is highlighted in red so it's file so it contains the word file and it, it is highlighted in red so if anything we put into the quotations it will search through the contents of the files with the criteria so for example if you just search for testing echo with space and e you can see that we have it and it just highlights the part that you are searching for now you can also change the criteria instead of only text files you can put dos files dos x files or pretty much any file but if you just put in asterisk it will search everything including the directories this will give you nothing so it's it will cause an error with the grep command The sudo command is a command on any system that allows you to run commands as the root user. So if you type in who am I to see the user I am logged in as, we can see Kali. So I am logged in as the user Kali. Now, the sudo command, if we, uh, for example, if we go to the directory, like uh, the home directory, we can see that the Kali user has his own home directory. So let's let's see the the user Kali has his own home directory. So you can see that in the Kali directory we can see desktop pictures and other things. Now the root user, the root user also has a directory called slash root at the file system. So if you try, you can see that it is permission denied. Now th there at least has to be one user of a system, and that is the root administrator. So if we type in sudo who am I, you, you, we try to see who is the uh, administrator, sudo who am I. It will ask us for a password of the root user, so you always need to at least the password. Now when you type in the password, it doesn't show you, so that's uh, how it happens, why there is empty. Now the root user that is the name of the user is the root user. Now, if you type in ls, ls, try to see what is inside the root user. Okay, sudo ls slash root. So we can see what is inside the root directory. We can see that there is a desktop. So there's a desktop in the root directory. Now, the, there at least has to be one user on Linux, and that is the root user, and other there can be other users as well. So it is a multi-user system. Now, the sudo command is a very dangerous command because it allows, if somebody has a hold of it or can run sudo, it, it can, they can literally do anything and they can damage the system. Okay. So every file in Linux has permissions. So these files. So if you want to see the permissions, you just have to right click and see the permissions tab. So you can see that there are three types of permissions: one for the owner, one from the for one for the group, and all the others. So the owner Caddy has read and write access. The group Caddy has only read access, and the others has read only. And you can see that there's the choice called allow this file to run as a program so if you want to see these files is the, this permission we just have to type ls my slash l or ll for short so you can see that here we have dr w a x r x r and x so for example the t you have three the r w r and r so if you want to specifically look at the permissions of one file we just have to type LL and then the file that we want. So 
these RWs, Rs, and Rs correspond to the permissions we have here on the graphical user interface. So the read and write, RW means read and write for the Kali. Read is for the group Kali. And only one R is for the read of the others. So if we type, if you check add this file to run, we can see that we have added another X. So this means execute or run as a program. So if we do this, we can see that it has reverted back. We can also change the, these properties from the file system instead of using the graphical user interface. So if we just, uh, so if, for example, if we change for the group, re, the, the group can read and write, you can see that now we have RW instead of where there used to be R. And like this, you can also change the, the others. So now it is RW. Now you can also change it directly from the terminal. The way you change it from the terminal, if you just type ch mod, ch mod, yes, ch mod, then you just have to, for example, plus x means you it will click the button. This plus x means that it is allowing the program, to, the the file to run as a program. So if we look at the properties now, it, it allows rx and rx and rx. Now we can also add uh, minus r to unclick the button in the graphical user interface. So you can see that the permissions has changed again. We can also add for the individual groups, our owners and others. So if we just type ch mode, and we can classify this. So what what uh, group has what uh, permissions? Ch mode uh, user has the right to read. Uh, group has the right to read, and others are also has the right to, to write. Example dot txt. So this will change. This will change the permissions, and you can see as the graphical interface that it has changed read and write only. So you can see that it has changed. So in, for the individual uh, types of permissions, you can change them with using the R and G and O. So users, groups, and others. If we just want to, if we want to change this, for example, from uh, write only to read only, you can see that it has changed now in the graphical unit surveys. So the widget command is a command that allows you to download files from, given a link, the widget command will download the file to your file, to your folders. So if we type widget http somewebsite.com dot some file dot zip, it will download this some file dot zip. Now this isn't an actual link or a file, so it won't work. Now let's try to download an actual, an actual picture. So here we have the Kali names. Okay, so this is not an this is not one. So let's search for a picture of puppies. So it's searching for a picture of puppies, and I will just far fast forward this. So as you can see, we now have the picture. So if we just right click and copy image link. Link, copy link location so copy copy image is to copy the file copy image link copies the url of the file so if we widget that the if you paste it right in you see that we we're downloading it so when you're downloading it we don't we can't do anything with it. so we just downloaded the file and this is a picture of the puppy so with the, when you are typing the widget command, you can't actually do anything because it, it downloads it. So one way to do this is to do something else is to use the B flag. Okay, and uh, for note, if you hold control and use the arrow button, you can jump between the words. So if we use the B flag, it will allow us to download to the background so you, we can do anything and it's still downloading the file. So if we see, it has now downloaded this file. 
So in the meantime, we can do anything we want. Anything we want in the meantime, that's done. So the curl command is a command that allows you to basically communicate with any computer over the internet with any protocol. So if you've never heard the word protocol, it basically means a way for you to transfer data on the line. So for examples of protocols can be HTTP, HTTPS, uh, PT, FTP, SSH, and other protocols. For example, HTTP, if we type um, HTTP is mycomputer.com. Uh, okay. Okay, let's go to uh, HTTP reddit.com. Okay. So you can see the HTTPS protocol. So HTTPS www.reddit.com. So Reddit is one is HTTPS is one of the protocols. There is also HTTP. And there are uh, curl the curl, the curl command basically can interface with all of those protocols. So for example, if you just type HTTP, HTTP um, is my computer on is my computer on com. So this website will just basically tell you if your computer is on. And it basically returns yes because you it basically returns yes because your computer works. So you can see this has given us the HTML output. So for example, if you are downloading a huge, uh, this is the core command. And if we want more information like help, so you can see the data, all these flags, the remote, every, every, every all of these flags. So okay, uh, clear. Now. Let's say that we wanted to download um, a file. So limit limit speed. Yeah, I think so it is. Okay, so so there's a basically a flag you can use to limit the speed. And so okay, so it's in. I think it's in the manual. I think it's in the manual. So man pro. So you in the manual, let's find the okay, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, so limit rate. So if we basically type, if we basically type curl, uh, HTTP, limit rate, and let's say one, two, three, B. So 1,234 bytes. And since this is a small file, it will basically be the same. But if you are downloading a huge file, this can allow you to control the bandwidth that download is taking up. You can also output direct. Uh, you can also output directly to a file. So if we say curl, um, and we use a uh, or flag, so to computer.html, you can see it's downloading and is going to give us a file. So this is an HTML file. So basically, this is what your browser uses to open files, and this is the yes. So our computer is basically working. So you can use any URL or any website you want. So let's try curl HTTP google.com. And Google redirects you to www.google. So you, they want you to use this URL. But this is HTML. This is what you use in your browser. So archives are a compressed collection of files or it could be a single file that is used in Linux to store files or send them over the internet in way in a single package. So for example, we see we have different formats of uh, archives. We have 7z, tar.7z, uh, usually it is gz, pix.zip. So if we open this, 
you can see that there is uh, files here in the zip in the zip folder in the seven tar z okay so this is a tar file so if you actually open this it also has a tar file so it's basic it has this it has the pictures inside it you have you also have seven z so if you want to extract this you can basically just click this and then just tap extract uh, if you want to put it in a document uh, Fix. Extract. So it is finished. And you can see the photos. So that is from the 7Z. Let's say we want to pick. So we want to extract. And then close. And you can see the photos. No. Okay, so the 7C is deleted. Okay, the 7C is deleted. So you can also unzip this. So as you can see, we unzip this by just clicking it and typing extract. You can also unzip it. So if you go to the documents, documents, and you just have to type unzip, fix slash unzip. Yes, and yeah. If you just type this, you can see we just un unextracted this. So you can unextract it this way. And for uh, if you want to extract this, this has two different protocols. So the tar and the 7z. To unextract this, you just have first you have to uh, extract the tar from it. So you just uh, 7z. 7dx pix uh, pix dot tar dot 7z. So it will first extract the tar this, then from tar then x then tar then pix pix dot tar. Okay, okay. So missing missing this option. See now you can see that we have a. Uh, extracted them from this piece now let's look at how to create the uh, archives so if you go to pictures uh, pictures let's go to picture as well uh, fix. so you can see these these are all the photos And one of the ways to build a to build an archive is to click the files, then create a create archive. So when you create archive, it tells you the picture the name. Then it allows you to do all these files from seven z arg star seven z tor z. Now one of the most common things you'll see in uh, one of the most common you'll see is the zip and the tardo gz and this is very common in linux so you'll see that in uh what when you code or in your linux journey so if you just create it you can see that there's a tardo gz so if you want to extract it you just have to type x uh, xf then okay we already saw how to extract it but now when you make uh, make them for uh, when you create archives you can you use a gui or you can also do it from the command line so if we ls these are all the files and let's say we want to make a zip file out of them so zip then the name of the zip file so pix.zip then all the names of the files so business uh, line I think uh, th th one three and th six. So you can see that we have made the zip file. Contain it. You, it has all the files. Uh, and instead of typing uh, everything up manually, you could just um zip text those 
zip and then just type everything so it will extract it will archive every file so we have the same thing so this is for the zip file so if you want to create a tar file out of this uh, a tar a tar file you it is you just have to type tar and the the flag c z f i think it is yeah c z v f c z v f then the name of the file so tar dot fix fix dot tar then all the files so we can see we have these files the user add command is one of the best commands on linux 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 so user add user add so linux is a multi-user system that basically means that multiple users can use a linux so multiple users can log in and use it just like windows and most servers now most servers use linux for their operating system and allow you to connect through it to ssh or any other platform to use the console so you basically don't have access to the gui in linux when you every single time you try to log in you you have to make a user before you can log in so for uh, by default my operating system has the user Kali. Today we are going to add a new user. So to actually add users, you have to be a super user or an administrator. In Linux, that basically means you have to have the authority to do it. Since Kali is the root user, I just have to type sudo user add, then the name of the user I want to add. So let's say user one, user one. For, uh, for our first user so you just have to type the password of the youtuber then i have just created a new user now for me to actually log in as this user i have to actually set the password so password user one then it uh, it uh, tells me to add the new user so you actually cannot see the password so if you type and you don't see anything that basically means you are typing but it actually works just know that so the i just i have just set a password now if i actually log out and try to uh, if i actually log out right now uh if i actually log out i can log in with this new password See, uh, for see, it, it didn't show the not allowed. So the main reason that uh, it does not work right now is because we still haven't added a new uh, a new home directory for the user. So let me just get back to what I was saying. So file system home. So this is the user. So Kali ha actually has a home directory. Now to add a home directory for our user when we make a user we have to use this create home directory create home with this flag user user two okay. see now user two has a uh, this one so if i just just set the password user two Now I just have to switch users, so it's basically fast password to switch users. So now user two. So now I can actually log in. So I can actually use this user. So you you see it works. It works now because this user has a home directory. The home directory contains the download the folders, everything, the, the file system for the user to actually exist. So you can see that this is a new operating system, a new user. So I, if I go back to the original user. So that is basically how you create a new user.
So when you create a new user, you you just make the user with the home directory. You can you can you have the option not to use as a, not to use passwords. I basically think that for Linux, passwords are kind of mandatory because if um, to do to basically do anything, you have to use the sudo command, and the sudo command will not work if you don't have a password. So just keep that in mind that you have to have password. Hello guys, today we are going to learn about the RM command. So the RM command basically stands for remove. So there are two variations of this command. There's RM, just RM. So this is basically used for all types of files and directories. You can, you can also use RMDR, so remove directory. Now this only works for empty directories. For example, let's make a new directory. MT directory. So we have just made a new empty directory. Now, if I try to delete this with RMDIR, so you can see it's actually empty. So if I try to remove this with empty, it works. Now let's make the new uh, the folder again. But this time, let's um, let's have a new uh, and uh, inside it a folder file. So let's just cat test. Okay. Uh, so we are going to have some text inside. Uh, okay. So quotes, quotes and T. Mm. Okay. So reverse, reverse. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, if we okay, echo, echo, uh, no, echo. I didn't see the command. So, if we see, we have the test.txt. So, now let's try to remove this uh, folder. So, if we actually try to remove this folder, rmdir empty again, it will. Uh, it will uh, not allow us. So we have to. It has to be an empty folder. So if you, so the RM the remove directory only works on empty directories. So if there is a folder or a directory, another empty directory, it could be empty. If there is anything inside the folder, it will not work. But the remove command doesn't uh, uh, on uh, doesn't uh, technically allow us. So you kind of have to use another. Okay, so if I try to remove this directory with the rm command instead of the remove directory command, mt, so it, it won't allow you. But if you use, uh, use the option r for recursive, so it will delete everything inside it and uh, all the everything inside it, including all the folders and all the files inside those folders, it will actually work. So the remove command basically has some flags. So if you just type it manual, you can see all the all the all the, uh, all the options. And one of the, the one I just used is the recursive command. So this basically removes their directories and their contents recursively. So on Linux, when you actually delete a file, it can't just delete the file folder automatically. It has to delete everything inside that folder. So, if, for example, if I have a folder called folder one, and inside those uh, in that, that inside that folder one, I have another folder called folder two. So inside the, inside of it, so if I just uh, go to that folder right now, so you can see that I'm in folder one in folder two. For me to delete folder one. I actually have to delete everything inside folder two, then folder one, then I can de then I can delete folder one. So it's a very roundabout way of deleting folders. So if I try, you, if I try removing it, it will not work. So that's why you have to add the the that's why you have to add the recursive. So it recursively deletes and. If you know anything about programming, you know why we have to do things recursively, and deletion on Windows and the Linux works recursively, recursively like this.
the copy command is a command that is like the move command. It has a GUI equivalent where you just type this and then the copy. So we'll paste it into the the desktop. You can see it here. Now, so most of the time you won't have access to the GUI, so you won't be able to use the copy paste from the GUI. So you'll have to do it manually through the Linux terminal. To do that, you just type cp and the file you want to copy for this, we just have to type example.txt and where we want to copy to. Now we will want to copy to the desktop, so we just type desktop. And you can see that we just copy this file. Now, if you want, this is how you copy one file, but if you want to copy two files, the syntax is, again, here, then, again, the file, the other file you want to copy, and file.txt. So you can see we have two files now. Two files. Now, so that basically means the last argument, the last pass you set, is the destination, the destination of your copied, uh, copied folder. Other than that, you can also copy directories. For example, if we make a directory called folder one, it's folder one. If you want to copy folder one like this, if you want to copy like this, like this, we just have to type this, then folder. So you type, you have to have this this last slash here, this uh, backslash. So this is a this this is how you, the Linux differentiates it from and a file. This is how Linux differentiates a folder from a file. And then again, desktop. Now, uh, for this, it doesn't actually work because it's a folder, so you have to use the R flag, which is recursive, as we know. So this is how it works. You can also use patterns. So, like, uh, you can also use reg uh, regular expressions. So, if you just close this, if you want to copy all the txt files or all the folders or all the documents or any file format we just have to use cp then anything dot txt so this is the asterisk command so using the asterisk command you can you can use it as a placeholder for anything in a regular expression then we just have to type desktop now it will copy every single every single text file in this folder to the desktop and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the copy command. So the next command we are going to see is the MV command, which is basically move. Now the move command, as you will see, you can just type in the manual for it MV, is kind of uh, pretty long, but to make it short, we are going to see with examples. For now, let's go back to the GUI. In this directory, we have two two uh, two screens. Now we have two files: example.txt and file.txt. Now, moving, you can move with the MV command. You can move files. You can move directories. You can also rename them if you want. That's uh, kind of uh, you can rename them as much as you want. You can also move directories and files. So, let's say for example that we want to move this example.txt to the documents or the desktop the desktop now usually this is very simple uh, just just as simple as type uh, using you, you use it with the gi now it's the example directory but most of the time you won't have access you won't have access to the gi so if you are connecting to a remote server or something else you usually won't have access won't have gi access so you have to do everything through the terminal so if we want to move this to the example.txt to the desktop, we can just type mv, then the file we want to do in that is, since we're in this directory, we just have to type example.txt, uh, so like this, uh, this is a very simple syntax, you want to type in the file you want to move, then the directories, for, for this one we're going to just use the desktop, so if you just type, type desktop, you can see that we have just moved it from the home directory to the desktop. Now, if we want to move it back to where it was, we have to use, again, the desktop, then example.txt, example.txt to where we are right now. So we have just returned it. Now, we are going to look at how to move the directories. So if we just make a new directory right here, make your folder one, 
Now we are going to move folder one to the desktop. So if you just type move MB folder one, folder one to the desktop. Now you can see it. Now we just have to return it, uh, return it, uh, return it back. Desktop, then folder one, folder one to here. Okay. Okay. So I just type the CD. Okay. MV, then the home directory. Now, the, uh, you can also rename directories with it. To rename directories is kind of a little bit complicated, but let me run, run through it. So we have this folder one, folder one. Now we are going to rename this to folder two. So if you just type MV, then folder, then you are going to just type the new name or have the previous destination. But since we are in already in the home directory, we're just going to type it again to folder two. Now, what this will do that like you'll see in the second is just change the name, change the name. This only works for folders. You can also rename files with this like this example.txt, then example one. So you can see it. I just typed in 11, but now you can you, you can use this syntax, the name, then what you want to write it as. So you can use uh, you can basically use this syntax to change the name of folders, or you can use this folder. Okay, folder. Uh, okay, so recursive. Okay. So you can use this syntax, syntax with the MV command to change the name of files folders, move them from folder to files, move folders and move files. The next command we are going to see is the make directory command. So the make, di the make directory command allows you to just make uh, folders. So if we just type in one, you can see that we have just made a folder. But what if instead of just making a, a folder, okay, so, you actually would want to make folders inside of folders inside of folders. So if you just try to just do what I just said and then make folder to inside of it, you can do that. So one of the main flags you use to do what I just do is just this and just choose the P flag. So if you actually use the P flag, you have now inside of folder one, inside, inside of folder one, you have folder two, and then as much, so you uh, uh, like this. So you can use this to make a chain as long as you want. So more and more chains. So if you just type in this, I'm just going to remove this now because we don't need it. So you can use the M flag, uh, P flag to move chains. Now the other thing is you you can use the M flag, the make there, then M, then for, for this one, I'm just going to use 777 and then folder one now if you actually look at the permissions properties and then the general permissions you can see that we have all read writes on, on this uh, folder now we are going to remove this we don't need it we don't need it really right now now let's make it with new permissions like six 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 so now you can see that it is very different from the other folders if you actually look at the permissions, now it is ju only just read and write, but, uh, okay, uh, okay, the permissions are kind of wrong, but uh, let me correct the permissions. So instead of using 56555, five, 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 we just use 555. Okay, okay, oh, le, le, we have to delete first. So you can see that this is now locked. So our permissions are the read only, you can see. So you can use this to make folders with you you just you use this to make folders. So now if I uh, I, just, I you kind of delete this, yes, yes. So to delete when you use the M with five 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 five, so five 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 basically stands for only read only read only for the user read only for the group read only for everybody. 777 seven, seven means you have every access. You can read and write. So it basically allows you to do anything, 555, five, five, and only allows you to do read only, read only. But there are a lot of a lot of other other permissions. So if we actually look at the, uh, there are a lot of uh, permissions. So this 
the M we just use us. So it's basically uh, with the change change mode, you can use this to actually change. You can use this to make folders with specific permissions. Now we have just looked at how to make folders. You can use this to name. You can use this to make folders inside of folders. You can use this to cha make folders with special permissions. So that is basically how you use the make directory command. The property and the pushd commands are two variations of a command that allow you to store your directories or your the path to the directory in the memory stack. So if we try to see our directory right now, you ju I just typed pwd, which means p print working directory. It shows that that we are in home Cali. So you can see that this uh, tilde, this symbol is called a tilde. This tilde shows where we are. We are in the home directory. When you go back two levels up, so you are actually in the root of your uh, hard drive. You can see this is now a slash. So uh, there's a difference between this tilde and this uh, this tilde and this slash. So the slash basically represents the root of your hard drive. This tilde represents the root of your home user. So if we go back to our users right now, so we are logged in as the key user can. So when you type push D, so it doesn't work right now because we're in the tilde. Uh, we are in already in the home directory. But if we type dears, you can see that we just have the tilde. Now, if we go to some, we go, if we go to the documents, and we just type in push D, you can see that we are back inside the we are back inside the home directory. So, if we, I just type pop D, or no, I, if I just type dears, you can see that now we have the documents directory. And if I go back to the the documents, the downloads, uh, I go to the downloads directory and use push D again. Now. If I type dears, you can see that I have documents and downloads. So if I just type, where where am I right now? Pop D. Pop D. You can see that now I'm in the downloads directory. So what this basically shows is shows us is if I type dears, you can see that I'm in the downloads directory. Now if I again type pop D, I can see that I'm still in the the downloads. But let's type dears again. Let's go back. Then type pop D. Okay, okay. Uh, so okay, the directory stack is empty. But look, the dears command allows you to see the stack, the the path, the stack of the uh, path we have. So what push D basically does is it puts your current directory to the your your current directory to the stack. So if I just type in. Uh, you can actually do it with uh, you don't have to be in the folder to do it But if I just type in dot etc, you can see that now I'm in the etc But if I just go back again, then I just type pop D Then you can see that I'm back in so The push the allow uh, command basically allows you to go to a stack now if I type more than one I stack more than one so etc then I type push D then home then now i'm in the home so i'm jumping so now the the top of the stack is home then there's etc but if i type pop d then now i'm in back in etc now what this basically means is if i go back right now the push d and the pop d are basically stacking and popping so when you push D, you are pushing the directory on the stack. You push the directory. That's what push D means. Popping the directory means you are taking a directory off the stack. Push D puts a directory on your uh, push uh, on your stack, and pop D basically pops it off. So the first one in is last one out. First in, last out. So. For uh, for some examples, let's go back to let's go to tilde. I'm in home now. If I actually go to documents, then push D, then I go to downloads, downloads. Uh, okay, so okay, so if I go to downloads, uh, downloads, 
now if i push push d then now if i go back see look i have just got into the, the documents now if i pop the i am returning back to the downloads so you can do this uh so you can use these two commands to basically transverse and go for multiple multiple back and forth between directories that you don't even have to go back to the the tra trace pass so one uh, if you okay so this doesn't work but you don't have to constantly jump you can use the push d and the pop d to basically traverse the file tree without actually having to go back moving on we are going to look at the change owner command now the ch or uh, the ch or the change owner command is very different than the, ch the, the ch mode so uh, most people get this confused but if we try to look at the permissions you can see we have, here we have the permissions read and write the read only the acts the uh, you can see the ability to run it as a program and other things but these are all permissions the change mod command we learned in the first uh, sections that changes these the permissions now changing the owner means changing this part in linux we have owners owners uh, or single users and groups groups is just a group you can have zero or one you can have zero to any number of users in a group but you can only have one user to, for a single name so if we ch ch try to change the try to change the file for example we try to change the owner of this file uh, example uh, the, ch the owner of example.txt to user2 two, user2 two. so okay so i just uh, i i i think that okay the H1, then user2, user2, example2, example.txt. So you see, I just, I've just changed the ownership of example.txt. Okay, so you, uh, for this file, we actually need pseudo permissions because this is a command that is a, needs you, is any pseudo commands. So you see, we have just changed user2. So now the owner of this file is user2. Now that basically means I can't change the permissions. So the, to change the permissions of a file, you have to be the owner of the file. Since the owner of the file was Calinix, I could change it. But now that it is the, the owner of the file is user2, I cannot change the permission. So you can see that the options are actually grayed out. So if I actually try to delete, delete this, it does, but... Okay, now let's change the ownership of the of file.txt. Uh, now, if I've ch I've changed the ownership of uh, file.txt, now I cannot change the permissions. I can't. Uh, I can't. Uh, for example, if I actually just try to write write a new thing in this, save. I can't save it. See, I can't. I'm I'm type. Uh, I'm trying to save it, but if I just type save, see, I can't save it. You can't save it now. So you uh, you cannot uh, save. See, you save as it. You can't save it. So you cannot change the contents of this file anymore you can only read it so the owner changing owners of files is basically a way to protect it against uh, to protect it to change so if you have multiple users on a file uh, on a on a system and one administrator one administrator there's only one administrator and other users the administrator will change the or people other 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 users will change the owner of the will change the owner of the file so that they could access it so if i if i was logged in as another user so i basically couldn't change the permissions nor could i write anything because i can't change the owner The WC, the WC or the count word command is a command that allows you to look at the contents of a file or to summarize the contents of a file. For example, here we have this file.txt. Now, this file.txt had the word has three lines, three lines and six words. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. So six words and three lines. Now, if I just type WC, WC file.txt file.txt you will see i have two two okay so yeah six words this must be two lines so this actually is two lines because 
uh, it counts as an index, so it includes 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. So this this first line is 0, the second one is 2, 1, and 2, and 3. So if I actually just type one more, then save, then if I type it again, now it will be 3. So you can see it is 6 and 34 characters, 34 bits of characters. Now, if I want to do multiple files, I'll just create a new document. Uh, create documents. Test. Test. Okay, so I should just rename it to .txt. Now, if I gibberish, gibberish at home new york world so if i just save it and if i want both of these files text.txt then you can see this is for file.txt this is for text test okay text.txt and total so this is the sum and this is everything now other things you can do is you only look uh, you can use also you can also use other flags for example if i just type this with the l flag you can see you can see this is it only you can only see the lines and uh, you can also use the b flag for bytes i think it's a b flag so okay so let me look at the manual so in the manual you can see these are the lines these are the bytes, so this was the command I was about to show you. These are the characters, the number of characters, and this is the max line, the words, and you can see oh, oh, you can see everything. So if I want to look at the number of bytes, I just have to type this, then for the text, then you can see I have 66, 36 bytes. And if I want to look at the, yeah, if I want to the max line, the max line, File.txt, then you can see I have 12. So this is the max number of ca characters per line. And for file.txt, this, uh, this, I think this one, this one has 12. One, two, three, and six. Yeah, it has six, six characters. So this line has six characters and 12, 12, so 12, so 12 bytes. The diff command is a command that allows you to see the difference between files and folders. So, for example, here I have two files, file.txt and text.txt. So, file.txt and text.txt. So, you can see here at every single line, these two files are very different. So, if I try to see the difference, difference between these two files, file.txt and text.txt, and if I just t enter, you can see that I have testing echo here for the first file, file.txt, and these files for text.txt. So you can see that these files do not match. Now let me make a new file. Let me make a new file. Test.txt. And let me just put in here file.txt. And let me just copy everything and save. So it, now if I try to see with test, test.txt, you can see I have nothing because these two files are the same thing. You can also use the S flag to check if the two files are similar. Now you can see that they are identical. But if I just add a little bit of here, and if I try to check, you can see that here in the last line, I have an empty line. Now I can also just E, another E, a double E, then you can see. I have, you can see the difference. So these two lines do not match. So the test.txt is unique in that it has this line here, this empty line, and this double E. So this line, this uh, double E, and this line here. And this Linux, this uh, file.txt is different because it has this. Now, if I actually just put uh, a space between here, now you can see that it's only different. So it shows you at the start of the beginning, so at line at line number zero, that there is an empty space here. So it actually shows you where the difference is occurring. So that's one thing to keep in mind.
the diff command can also tell the difference between folders. So, for example, I have two folders, videos is empty and pictures is empty. Well, actually, it is not empty, but let's say public, public is empty. So, if I try to see the difference between videos, videos and the public, public, you can see that they are the same. So, I can just use the S flag. Uh, so, okay, what about instead of that, I just use the desktop. So you can see that only in desktop that do these files exist. Only in desktop do these files exist. These specific files only exist in my desktop. Only exist in my desktop. So you can use the diff command to basically allow you to see the difference between files. The man command or the manual command is a command that allows you to see the documentation or the manual for any command. So, for example, if I just type man, man, you can see that I am looking at the manual page for manual, the, the man command. So, man is an interface to the system's reference manuals. So, these are manuals. Now, these manuals have certain pages or sections. So, any, any command, any command, has the has at maximum nine sections of a command so one through nine the first the first section is for program uh, the shell commands then the, the second is for system calls library calls and other things and you can see that at nines we have kernel routes so every uh, every command uh, any command have at maximum these nine sections of the manual so you can also see that the man command has some has some uh, as some examples, you can see uh, the manual of the endless command, the manual of anything, and you can also see this. Now, one other thing you can do is when you look at the man command, for example, if I check man endless, you can see that I have the manual for the list directory command, but the the list directory command has some section. For example, the sections section 4 of endless command is okay there is no uh, section four but what about section number one so section number one is a uh, file before that what about section number two so so the endless command actually has only one section but some commands only or uh, most commands have only one section others have more than one and you can figure those commands by yourself but that is, is the main command The PS command is a command that allows you to show all the process running on a system. So if I just type PS, you can see that I have these two system, uh, processes running on my system, the ZSH and the PS. This is how long they've been running, the command, the process ID, and the TTY. So the, this is only showing what I'm running. So if I actually want more information, I should just type PS -A -A -U -X, and you can see that I have a whole host of processes. All the processes on my system so you can see these are the users who can, who's uh, running them the user the pid the percentage of cpus percentage of memory the vc rcs tty sat start when it started the time how long has it been running the command what's the command and you can see all of the, all of the information here now if you want to see uh, all the uh, the commands that only one user is running so you can i should just Use the new command and user two. I don't have a user two, so you can see he's running. He's running no commands since he's not logged on. But if you actually try to use a user that is non-existent, it will say user does not exist. Now other options with the ps com uh, the ps commands are you should just use the manual for these commands. So the ps command just reports a snapshot of current processes. Now because PS, the PS command has many different implementations, there are three ways you can use the PS command. You can use the Unix version, the BSD version, and the GNU long options with two dashes. So the Unix options has one dash, the BSD has no dashes, and the GNU has two dashes. So I just choose AUX without no dashes, that's a BSD operation. You can also use it with a dash a, a unix so for example this and this are kind of the same but uh, it kind of gives you a warning if you use it with one dash 
because you have to specify a user if, you, if there's no user it will just give you a warning and do everything you can also see these are the process of elections that select the deselect and a ways of matching so you can use the PIDs of the processors to see the the processes themselves you can also use the U for user lists users formats and anything you want generally and that is a paste command the kill command is a command that allows you to send the kill signal to any single command or any single process so if you type a psaq you can see that we can see all the processes all the processes now let's say we want to kill some of these processes so let's say i want to kill this terminal right here so this terminal okay this is the px da, 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 da. it should be this the sh command or we'll just look at the time we'll just use the time as an indicator of which command to kill okay uh this is not a, not the command not hit nah, okay so we'll just kill this one kill kill one two seven one then done oh, just five. Oh, okay so pid we should just kill see we just use the pid to kill the terminal so let's try it again so you just to, do you just have to use the pid the process id to kill it so for example uh, again let's kill the terminal 1619 this time kill 16, 19, then it's dead. Now, other options with the kill command is kill one, 9, 1. Now, this command will kill everything. Anything that can be killed will be killed. So, this is killing everything. So, my system is shut down. So, it's, it basically logged me out because it basically logged me out because it actually killed everything. So this is uh, one way you can kill everything on the system. Other options, other options are you can, if you see the kill command, you can see the other options are signal and list and table. So this is the command I used to kill everything, and you can also use it to translate. So that is basically the kill command.